Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to be here today, too. And like Katrina was saying, the story I want to share with you today is about the Wounded Knee Memorial Ride that I've had the honor of participating in the last four years. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to make some of my intentions clear today. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is about painful events in the past, um, and they're sensitive topics too. And so the words that I'm going to be using to describe my friends according to their wishes are Lakota, native, native people, native communities, native tribes. I'm going to use the phrase Native Americans, but that's not what they use themselves. And I want to invite you um, and invite your understanding as well. If you are from a Native community yourself, and this is not how you want to be referred to, I invite you to please share with us at the end of the talk. And so to get started, I want to tell you how this journey started for me. And what brought me to Wounded Knee several times now was actually a book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. And I'm just curious, uh, has anybody read this book? I think I, nobody. Over here, okay, okay, great. Well, I urge all of you to read this. Um, what this book documents is the last half of the 1800s and in one uh, review, it says it tallies up all of the murders, all of the massacres, the broken treaties that ended up leading to Native Americans being essentially forced onto reservations. And for me, after reading this book, the world really changed for me. I was completely heartbroken. I was appalled uh, and I was ashamed that this happened in our country and that I didn't know about it. Um, in addition to this, I was also deeply, deeply moved and inspired reading the words of the Lakota chiefs and other tribes, chiefs and individuals. They spoke to me with a sense of dignity and connection and community. Um, that revealed something that was missing in, in my life. And I can't really describe exactly how I, or why I was so deeply impacted. Just at that moment, I felt like there was a hook in me. And all I could do was, was go forward and follow that. So I started reading everything I could about Native American culture, history, stories over the next two years. And at times, that was all I could think about. It was all I could talk about with friends. Um, and at one point, I think my mom, I think she curiously asked, Ziggy, what is this obsession about? And I thought, you know, she's right. What, what good does it do just to continue reading and reading when there are people from these communities living out there? And I got to learn more also about the challenges that are still deeply affecting reservations today. Alcoholism, drug use, poverty, disease. And I thought, I need to do something. And so in the summer of 2015, my partner and I, Jeffrey Schwinghammer at that time, uh, an incredible man, we decided to just get in the car and drive out to Lakota country, which is Wyoming, South Dakota, Montana, and just with the intention of let's learn as much as we can, let's try to connect with people and be in support if we can. And so we threw a few historical markers on the map and then we got in the car and just followed our guts. And that led us to, to many places. Um, it was a wonderful trip, but the trip changed at one point when we, um, we went to Wounded Knee. And, and actually, a, a book I was reading at the time was 
this one, I don't know why, but I felt like I needed to show you the actual books. <laughs> it, it's called Mitaki Asin, and it's by Dr. A.C. Ross. And so in this book, he, Dr. Ross talks about the vision quest. And I just got it in my mind like, I'm going to have a vision quest on this trip. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to have it. And so, so that day that we were at Wounded Knee, just after we, we left and we went to Red Cloud's grave at the Red Cloud School in Pine Ridge. And leaving the grave, we saw a bulletin board. And on the bulletin board, there was a flyer. And on the flyer, it said, Bearing Witness Native American Retreat, set to start the next day for several days. And a list of speakers on that, on the list of speakers was the author of the book. And so I thought immediately, vision quest. And so I went there the next day, and I found myself in, in this great valley in the Black Hills. And we were with the Zen Peacemakers International Group, with a few hundred people from all around the world who had planned to be there for over a year. And they had a reading list over the year. And I looked at the list and I realized I had read everything on the list. And so I felt like I'm supposed to be here. And over the next few amazing days, I met incredible people. We attended prayer circles, healing groups. We heard speakers. And on the last day, my partner and I, my partner at that time and I, we volunteered to take care of the ceremonial fire that had to be constantly lit the whole time. So we took our sleeping bags out, we camped by the fire, and at the fire there was a Lakota man there, Roderick, and his daughter Tamika. And we got to talk over several hours, we got to be friends, and Roderick told us that he found his path, he found his sobriety, he found his family by going on the Wounded Knee ride. And he told us all about it. And at the end of the conversation, he asked, would you like to join me in December? And so that December, I met Roderick in Bridger, and that would be the beginning of my journey for the next few years. And so at this time, what I want to do is share with you what happened at Wounded Knee, in case you're not aware. I think it's important to, for reference for the ride, but also I think that justice remains away for these communities because these stories aren't shared enough. And so in 1890, morale for Native communities across the U.S. was, was very low. They, to, to say the least, they had suffered unfathomable amounts of injustice and violence over the, the previous decades and actually centuries. And a lot of the great chiefs at that time had been killed. A lot of the people were put onto reservations. And so on December 15th, Chief Sitting Bull was killed in Standing Rock. And about a hundred of his band fled, and they went to meet up with Chief Spotted Elk, or Chief Bigfoot as he was called, uh, camped in Cherry Creek, South Dakota. And around the same day, Chief Spotted Elk found out that there was an issue for his capture and arrest. And so in an effort to save his people, he took his people and Sitting Bull's people a few hundred miles to get protection from Pine Ridge and Chief Red Cloud. So this journey took a few weeks. It was with about a 350 people, mostly women and children, mostly on foot, and through the blistering cold of South Dakota in December. On December 28th, when they were, I believe, within 20 miles of the Pine Ridge Reservation, they were overtaken by the army, they were disarmed, and they were allowed to camp at Wounded Knee. Um, the army was surrounding them, and they had 
four howitzer, howitzer guns placed on a hill aimed directly at camp. And those guns at that time were repeating rifles and they shot about a shell a second. And so the next morning, it's my understanding that there was a, a misunderstanding between a hearing impaired man and an army officer and a shot went out. And after that shot, the army opened fire on the unarmed group of Lakota people. And within a short while, over 153 people lay dead. There were some survivors, but because of people getting wounded and trying to escape that may have died in the snow, a lot of people put that number higher. And so the ride, the ride is to now commemorate what happened. It's to honor those that died and to try and heal the sorrow that happened. And I also want to say that even though the ride is to, it symbolizes and honors something so tragic, it's also extremely positive. It brings the whole community together. And it's a way for people to connect now in, a face, in the face of something awful that happened. And so the ride was started in 1986. And it started off with just a few people, I think five people in 1986. And it was meant to last four years, which is a sacred number. And after the four years, it continued though. And since I've been on it, the ride starts with about 25 people from Standing Rock. And as we go along, more and more people join in along the way. So that by the end, last year, we had about 175 riders ride into Wounded Knee, which was amazing. Some of the riders are as young as nine years old. And the grit of these kids is unimaginable. Um, and also the whole community comes along. So it's not just the riders, but it's the kids and the families and the friends all coming along to support. Um, here's a picture of serving lunch one day. Here's another picture of us riding out. And so along the ride, we have the riders mostly going cross country and then a huge caravan of horses, trailers, cars, following on the main roads all along the way. And here we have in the morning, so in the morning before we get started, since this is a sacred ride, what happens is the horses and the riders all stand in a great circle with an elder in the middle, with the staff carriers saying a prayer and saying a blessing for that day. And here's a picture of the staff. And the staff carriers are hugely, hugely important. It's believed that the staffs hold the ancestors and the spirits in them. So the staffs lead the way on the ride. No one is allowed to pass them. The staffs are meant to be held with honor. And even the young kids hold them, and it's, it's just a huge honor to be a staff carrier. Here is another photo of the staffs. And so along the way, like I said, um, it's just a really amazing thing that brings the community together. And there's actually a lot of laughing along the way, a lot of connecting, sharing your stories with each other. And I think it's also an amazing way for the young people to get involved with their culture in a way that's amazing, challenging, and totally selfless. And so I'd like to share with you a bit about my experience on the ride. And my first year, if I were to sum it up, if I were to give it a title, I would call it Cold and afraid. <laughs> that's, that's what I was. I was a lot of other things. I was hugely inspired, excited, but 
mostly cold and afraid. <laughs> the cold was unlike anything I have ever experienced in my life. I think on the first year it got down to negative 30. And so if you're not moving, if you're not on a horse, in two minutes your hands are completely frozen no matter what you're wearing on them. And I was wearing about three pairs of gloves, two pairs of socks with a plastic bag, and then snow boots. I felt like, uh, like a baby bird, just totally defenseless out there in the cold. And I was also, if I'm honest, really intimidated. I was constantly thinking, am I eligible to be here? Um, am I going to mess things up? Am I going to cause an injury while we're riding? And that's quite a serious thing to happen in, in those conditions. And it was kind of like if, if you're around 100 people that you have a crush on. That's <laughs> what it was like for me. I was just wondering, is, is anyone going to like me? Am I going to be accepted or am I just going to be hated? So pretty much I was just I was stuck in my own head. Um, but the first time I rode is an experience that I will never forget. Um, when, when you go and you don't have a horse of your own, you jump on a horse that's free if someone has one. If someone gets injured or if someone needs a break, then you can get on as well. And so one day, midway through the ride, there was an injury. And my friend Roderick asked me, can you ride? And I thought, this is my moment. I'm going to do it. Yes. And so I get on the horse, Snowflake. And two seconds into the ride, I've never been more terrified in my life. There was nothing I could do to convince Snowflake to listen to me at all. She just took off. And, and I had taken lessons before coming. I have also used to ride when I was a kid. And riding a lessons horse around in a circle <laughs> is not at all the same thing as riding a fire-breathing dragon <laughs> over frozen cross-country. And Snowflake was a dragon. Actually, the, the first time that I saw, or the time that I saw Jon Snow riding the dragon for the first time, I was actually like, I know exactly what that feels like. <laughs> Sorry, Anne. <laughs> Maybe they'll have the spoiler alerts on the online speech. <laughs> but that's what I felt like, and I was, I was equal parts terrified and mortified. I know I looked insane. I was bouncing all over the place, and I, I was literally just hanging on by a hair the whole time. And it, it was really all I could do not to just continuously scream, but I didn't. I made it in, and I was completely just shook, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And by a miraculous act of kindness, Victoria Roderick's wife, came to me later and she said, Ziggy, everybody's really proud of you. And <laughs> that was extraordinary. Um, but I still, for the next few days, I just kept my head down and focused on cooking, cleaning, setting up camp. And over some time, I was able to, to let go of what I thought I was supposed to look like and just be there for the experience. And so it may have sounded really awful, but I, I, was, I had an amazing, amazing time. And the last day, coming into Wounded Knee, another amazing thing happened. Um, we were at a stopping point, and I was watching the horses come in. And a friend of mine saw me, saw Jeff and I standing there, and he said, you guys got a ride. I've got some horses. Let's get on. This is a picture of riding into Wounded Knee. And so immediately I thought, like, no. <laughs> but I knew that was why I was there. That's what I came to do. So I needed to get on that horse again. So I, I got on the other horse, Socks, also a cute, benign name. And um, Again, the same thing started up. We were going down the road. As soon as Socks picked up, 
bouncing all over the place. And I just thought, no, what am I doing wrong? And I, I looked around at me at the other writers, and they were effortlessly moving with the horses, just going. And I looked at myself, and I was convulsed and holding on to the horn as tight as I possibly could. And there was a voice inside me that said, Ziggy, just let go. And so I, I did. I let go. And all of a sudden, my body just fell in rhythm with the horse. And I was moving with it. And it was the most magical feeling. And as I was feeling so amazing, all of a sudden, the gravity of the moment hit me about what was happening when we were riding in. And that was that so many years ago, Spotted Elk's people were riding in the same day on the same path after going through challenges so much greater than ours, after having suffered so much. And did they feel that same hope, being so close to their destination, with our lives on the line? not knowing that the next day, within a day, they would be captured and, and killed, nearly all of them in the snow. And so as we were riding into Winded Knee, the biggest lesson came to me, which was that this wasn't about my experience at all. This was about something much, much greater. It's about all of us. So one of the the lessons that I did learn along the way is that the ride is first and foremost a prayer ride. It's about going inward as much as it is going out there. And a dear friend of mine, Kermit, who is one of the organizers on the ride, had said, this is about all of us. When we're praying, we're not praying for just our families our communities, just native people. We're, play, we're praying for everybody because the whole world needs help and the world needs everybody to help. And so he said, when you stand in the circle, in the prayer circle before the ride, you become family. And from then on, the whole experience is about how you can contribute, how you can help your family make the whole journey and it should be just as important as it was for Spotted Elk and his people when they were helping each other get a, come along. Their, their lives depended on it. And Kermit said it should be like that with us too. The journey is also a prayer ride. And it's about connecting with the horse. So the horse is, is actually what gets you there. It's not us that makes the journey, it is the horse. And the horse bears the burden of carrying you, carrying your spirit, carrying your prayers. And thankfully for me, my riding did improve. <laughs> and so I was able to actually make connection with the horses. Though I'm very thankful for Snowflake for humbling me so. And another thing that I learned was that the contribution that I saw and experienced in the community, it doesn't end with the ride. So what, what point would it be to have a sense of family like that and to drop it after two weeks when the ride is over? So this sense of contribution for the community lasts the whole year. Kermit, my friend, and his riders, the Screaming Eagles, they cook for families all throughout the year. They do search and rescues if someone goes missing, if there's an incident with violence or drugs or alcohol. Um, this last year on Pine Ridge, when there was the flooding crisis, they went out there, they delivered food, supplies, they helped rescue families. And so when I asked Kermit, what is your motivation? What keeps you going? Especially when you see disheartening things on the reservation. And he said, when he started praying when he was a kid, he heard his grandmother say to him, the ways of our people are dead. And so he went out and he prayed and he realized 
that there is a greater spirit that wants us to help each other. And so when he's faced with a challenge and a decision, he prays and he tries to release his own stake in it and tries to see what, what is the best for all that I can find here, and I'll do that. And so this talk is about justice. And so how, how can we approach justice with groups that have experienced injustice for so long? And I feel like one is, is acknowledgement, is education. I think that every American should know the story about what happened here. And on top of that, more than that, I think it's about connection. So on top of reading, or better than that is talking to people, finding out what their experiences are, their feelings. Um, there's actually a, a huge history of non-native people with good intentions going to reservations and thinking and just saying like, I'm gonna help, I'm gonna, you know, make a difference, but without actually having the connection with the people there. So I think making connections, excuse me, is hugely, hugely important. And I also think that a lot of the work is internal. I think that for any outside transformation to happen, there needs to be an internal process as well. And if I can open up to you personally, I'd like to share something. I recently was able to acknowledge a lot of pain in my own life. And I don't say that with any shame. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think probably like a lot of people, I think, well, my life circumstances are so much better than a lot of other people, so I'm good. I don't need to look at that. But recently I was able to do a, a self-development training and I just saw how much my past experiences were filtering, were coloring my present experiences. And I think a course to that is to change courses, to examine what's there, to feel it, to acknowledge it, to let it go so that you can be present for your life and more present for the things that you want to contribute to. And what I really learned was that for me, I am only as free as the extent to which that I'm able to let go. Just like what happened on Socks riding into Wounded Knee. And so I, I'm not saying I've mastered that or that you should master yourself and get yourself sorted out before you go into contribution, but I think that your efforts will be much more successful if you're present for them if you're not bringing a ton of baggage with you, and if you're not solely focused on your own experience. And so I urge you to do some internal housekeeping. <laughs> and housekeeping is emotional work. And it's, but it's always much, much more difficult thinking about it than it is actually doing it. And it always feels better afterwards. And I wanted to also add, my friend Sean last week said, Ziggy, how can there be justice in the world if people don't actually believe that there's enough for everybody out there? Or that there's enough for themselves? And so I encourage you to do this work, to make connections, to educate yourself, and to understand that there is abundance enough for everybody so that you can receive as well as give. Because I think that being able to receive openly and fully and being able to give with your whole heart is a state of grace that I aspire to. And like Kermit said, the world doesn't need you next week. It doesn't need you tomorrow. It needs you now. And so with that, I'd like to do something right now. If you all are with me, I'd like to make a great circle here. 
Can we do this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Are we holding hands? Awesome. And so I'd like to change the energy in here a bit. Can we all raise our hands? Yes. <laughs> and answer me if you're feeling it. Can we change the world? Yes. yes. Can we change ourselves? Yes. I can't hear you, actually. <laughs> Can we change ourselves? Yes. Are we connected? Yes. We are connected. As Kermit said, once you step into the circle, you are family. And so on the count of three, we're going to bring our hands down. And when we bring them down, I want to hear a really loud yes. Is that all right? One, two, three. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'd like to share finally that on the last year of the ride, on the last day, one of the elders stood up in front of all of us and asked, why are you here? If you keep coming back here year after year, time after time, are you just getting an experience out of this? Or are you contributing something? And that stuck with me. And when the opportunity for this speech arose, I thought, if I could share the story of what I've experienced, and if any one of my words could plant a seed in any one of you to either contribute to support the Lakota community or to contribute to anything that you believe in, then this would be worth it. And so I thank you again, and I'd like to close with the words that we use in Lakota to end every prayer, which means we are all family. Mitakiwasen. Thank you. Woo!